Hello, my name is Jane Howard, and I've been working as a clinician and researcher in the field of applied behavior analysis and developmental disabilities for most of my professional life. And today I want to talk to you about the contributions that applied behavior analysis has made to individuals with different diagnoses and intellectual uh, delays and disabilities. I want to talk about what those contributions have looked like in the past, where we are today, and some of the issues that we will want to be dealing with as professionals going forward. We've got some challenges, uh, but we've also got uh, powerful science that may help us address some of those. What you see in front of you is a list of some of the different diagnoses that behavior analysts have helped treat. That is, individuals who have been diagnosed with Cornelia DeLange or Fragile X, Engelman syndrome, uh, Williams syndrome, that doesn't have to be, happen to be listed there, and certainly autism. We have done a lot of work in this, this particular area and made a lot of contributions. This list is not exhaustive, uh, but I certainly would say that we have made an impact, a positive impact in the lives of many individuals with these diagnoses and their families. One of the things to say is that behavior analysts are not, typically not very concerned about a uh, diagnosis, a diagnostic category, a, a nomenclature, because we're not in the area of necessarily doing genetic or biological research, but it is important for behavior analysts to know something about these different syndromes and disorders because that can be useful information for you as a clinician who's working with, with a family. For example, knowing that an individual is diagnosed with Pratt or Willie may give you uh, some insight into the fact that you better be prepared to address the fact that food is going to be a very powerful reinforcer or that individuals with autism are likely to have some significant needs in the area of social functioning. Um, so it is important that we know about these disorders, maybe something about their physiological uh, characteristics or patterns of behavior that have been observed in the past. But as behavior analysts, most of the time, when we're working with a family, we're working with an individual, we're going to be focusing on specific areas where we observe delays, deficits, needs, behaviors that are not happening, behaviors that are not happening enough. Often these are in the areas that are listed above. So it might be in communication or social functioning, self-help, development of leisure skills. We also are often concerned with finding replacement behaviors for behaviors that interfere with an individual's ability to learn or be able to be successful in a school setting or a community setting or any job setting. Uh, again, this list is not exhaustive, but this is more about how it is we think about behaviors, behaviors that we need to strengthen, behaviors that we need to replace because they're not appropriate or they limit an individual's ability to be successful in the community. Today, we're going to talk a lot about the work that has developed in uh, various areas to serve individuals with intellectual or developmental delays, including autism, which is the largest represents the largest number of individuals who are receiving ABA services. They also represent the most costly population from a public health uh, perspective. We're going to take a look at how ABA services have evolved and are now being provided to individuals in this general, large general category of developmental delay and what some of the unique needs and challenges are that are associated with the way those services are in fact being administered. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about the experimental and conceptual roots that have to do with uh, our, our current work as behavior analysts. Charlie Furster, who was a co-author with Skinner, 
uh, of one of the most important books in our fields. After he finished his uh, work at Harvard, he took a job at the University of Indiana Medical Center, and he brought with him the rigorous training he had as an experimental behavior analyst and started working with other professionals at the medical center to look at populations that they were in fact studying. And his colleague at, at uh, uh, Indiana was a psychiatrist named Marion Demer, and she was especially focused on, at the time, what was often termed schizophrenic children, or children with schizophrenia. And, and at this time, many children were actually institutionalized, and that, that happened to be the case at the University of, of Indiana Medical Center, and they began a partnership in which they had a small project in which they were trying to use social interaction to encourage more appropriate behavior on the part of these young children with schizophrenia, really autism, uh, and ways to get them to improve their eye contact, their language, their interest in other people. But that project actually came after some basic research work that Charlie started. He actually created a lab at Indiana. He took apparatus and he, he took a number of different apparatuses and ad adapted them so that the children who were institutionalized could come in one at a time to his learning lab and they could explore, they could pull buttons or push gadgets do different things and as a function of that, of their behavior uh, uh, with these different uh, levers and buttons and so forth, different things would happen, different consequences would happen. They got a chance to get some trinkets, they actually could see some small animals, a, a cover would lift and they could get, get a chance to see a bird, uh, they would get some edibles and one of the things that was discovered from Charlie's work in that lab as well as his partnership in the uh, socialization project was that children with autism their behavior was lawful and they could respond in the same way. Uh, they showed the same pattern of responding regarding specific schedules of reinforcement. And I think one of the things that was most important out of that was really an understanding that children with autism could learn. And what you see here uh, are some of the cumulative records. We don't see many of those today. But these are records that were produced by the children who would be responding and, pu and pushing buttons and uh, levers and so forth and so on and then receiving different kinds of consequences. They had one very important visitor that came by this lab in the summer of 1960 and that person was Sid Bijou and we're going to talk a little bit about the impact that he had on the field both in terms of typically developing children as well as perhaps less directly his encouragement and for working with children with developmental delays. So we have a very strong tie-in to our conceptual and experimental roots when it comes to talking about uh, applied behavior analysis and our work with individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities. I would say that today the field uh, of services uh, obviously has applied behavior analysis at its core, but one way you can break things up is in terms of the different treatment models that are being offered. I think sometimes ABA and autism or ABA and developmental disabilities looks like a big monolith. It's just one big thing. Everybody gets the same sort of treatment or services or people think that they understand it, but that's not really so. And today I'm going to walk you through intensive early intervention, which is probably in some ways the uh, particular treatment model that most people might be familiar with. It certainly has a long history. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what focused intervention actually is and what some of our challenges are in working in that particular area. And I'm also going to talk to you about the treatment of severe, dangerous, challenging uh, behavior. But we're going to begin first with intensive, comprehensive, early intervention. And one of the things that I would say is each one of those words, intensive, comprehensive, and early intervention, has significance. It's not there for uh, just because it sounds right. Intensive ha really has to do with addressing 
the need to provide services on a quite uh, intensive level. It also means that they have to be comprehensive. One of the things that's true about autism, as well as many other developmental disabilities, is that the domains that are affected are so broad. There, it relates to language and socialization and imitation and play skills and self-help, peer interaction, education, so forth and so on. It's also the case that early is an important part of intervention, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the data that we have, the limited data that we have around that. But before we go any further, I want to be able to show you a clip that I think gives people a bit of an understanding, a bit of an appreciation as to why it has to be comprehensive, intensive, and early uh, in terms of really trying to uh, treat appropriately ch young children diagnosed with autism. So in this clip, you're going to, oh, this is a lovely clip. You're, you're going to find yourself smiling throughout it. Uh, these are twin girls. They're 11 months old. They are facing their parents. Their dad is, is playing, going to play a song for them. And they are really at the level where they are not using sort of standard vocal language, but you can see the level of interest, the interaction with their parents, with each other, their desire to have everyone in the room, make sure they understand what's going on, and, and, to, and to enjoy it. So take a look at this clip, and besides enjoying it, watch what they do. Hi girls, it's August 6th. Is that right? Yeah. August 6th, 2012. Daddy's gonna play them a little song while they're you eating their ready? peas. You guys ready? So you can see they're imitating one another. They want to make sure everybody is engaged. They want to look at each other, see how it is that you're reacting to this. Uh, but what I want you to really appreciate is that this type of interaction, interest in the environment, knowledge about what's going on, desire to engage others, really represent important learning opportunities that typically typically developing children access every day. So by the time an individual, a young child is diagnosed with autism, uh, let's say they're lucky and they get diagnosed by the time they're three, we're looking at thousands of learning opportunities that they did not have, that they did not participate. So even though in the child looks young, uh, there's still a lot of catching up to do. So let's put a little bit of a, a, metaphor, a metaphor, I guess, a guide as to have some understanding about what that is. On this axis, you'll see time going by from birth through adulthood. And over here, we have low to high development that could be social, cognitive, whatever it happens to be. And what happens in typical development is that we have this very steep learning curve. You can see this here that tends to start flattening out into adulthood, but what happens to individuals with developmental delays is while they may start out just slightly below in these areas uh, compared to their typically developing peers, what happens is that the gap gets bigger and bigger over time. And so this is speaking a bit to the notion about why early might be better. But we as behavior analysts and people working in the early of area of early intervention don't accept this trajectory. And by the way, these data actually come from our program where we were able to plot out um, baseline scores for individuals, the, the ones I'm gonna show you on the next page. We don't accept that that's how things have to be. What we are looking for is to take advantage of what's called the zone of modifiability. This is a term that Craig Ramey and his wife uh, coined the idea that this might be where we are, but to what extent 
let me go back a minute, can we push into the zone of modifiability and can we get individuals up on the normal trajectory or at least closer? That's always our goal in early intervention. Now let's put some numbers to what actually has to happen to elevate someone so that they really could be functioning at the same level as their typically developing peers. That's what language development might look like in a typically developing child where they're 12 months old, their language is like a 12 month old, I'm gonna take that away, uh, and so forth. And when you're five years old, your language is similar to a child who is five months of age. But what happens in a typically developing child is that, and, and I'm sorry, these are the data I was referring to that came from our program in terms of their actual baseline scores prior to treatment. You can see the same kind of gap we saw on the earlier slide, and it's getting bigger over time. So our goal is to lift them off this trajectory. Let's see what would happen if we could just now start th having them learn at a normal rate where every year of intervention, their scores in language improve by one year. Well, it would be better. It would look like this. This is a one month uh, gain for every month of a treatment. So one of the things that you can see is the gap's not getting big bigger, but you can also see that it's not getting smaller. What we need to do in early intervention, intensive ABA treatment for young children with autism is we need to see if we can arrange to have that learning rate be higher than what is normal. Without that, children are going to go into school and their language may have improved from where they were, but they're not necessarily going to be able to benefit from the instruction that's being provided in the classroom, nor are they necessarily going to be able to interact with their peers in the same way. So intensity matters and having measures in which you can determine the extent to which progress is being made matters. So this is the concept that you need to have in mind when you start thinking about comprehensive intensive early intervention. We know the most about this when it comes to talking about children with autism. And now we're going to talk about the very first case study in which an individual provi was provided with comprehensive intensive early intervention, even though it may not have started like this. I mentioned Sid Bijou stopping by uh, Charlie Furster's lab. Well, he was working in uh, Washington at the time and he was assembling just a stellar group of young behavior analysts, doctoral students, postdocs and so forth and so on and two of them are uh, pictured right here talking about Mont and Wolf and Todd Risley and they had gotten a call, Sid had gotten a call in which he was asked, could somebody on your team help us with this young child with autism who had, was just being, had just been discharged from the hospital, he had had to have surgery to re remove cataracts from his eyes, and he wouldn't keep his glasses on, and he was in danger of losing his sight. Uh, and they said, sure, and they went out, and they uh, arranged for an intervention that n involved access to some good things, uh, including uh, uh, toys and TV and things of that sort uh, if he would keep his glasses on. But they began to see, okay, we were able to solve this practical problem and it's great that he's going to keep his glasses on, but he has a lot of other needs. And they had the wonderful opportunity to be able to continue working with Dickie uh, in an intensive kind of way. They worked with his parents, they worked with his preschool teachers, and indeed uh, he arguably is the first child to receive comprehensive intensive intervention and follow-up studies and interviews afterwards proved that Dickey did in fact, I'm happy to say, grow up and have a pretty meaningful uh, life. Uh, but the individual that most uh, is probably most well known for the work in comprehensive intensive early intervention for autism is Ivar Lovas. And he, coincidentally, was at Washington with Mont Wolf and Todd, Todd Risley, although he wasn't part of the behavior analysis group. He did uh, observe their work. And when he took his faculty position at UCLA, he really began to focus on children with autism and applied behavior analysis. Now he started out 
working with children who were in an institution because in those days that was really the recommended uh, prescription for parents, institutionalize your children. And he had a very extensive project involving his doctoral students working with a handful of individuals, young children with autism who were institutionalized. And he published a study on this in 1973. One of the things that it was, I guess you would say, is he, like um, Charlie Furster and, and like Todd Wol uh, Risley and Mott Wolf, were able to demonstrate changes. They saw performance improving. Uh, he did it in a very comprehensive way across domains. But one of the things that was very clear was that those gains were not maintained as long as the children, when the children were out of the program. Uh, and I think none of us would be surprised about that today. So it was very disappointing in that, in that sense, which is one of the reasons why he shifted his project and started to focus on even younger children and children who were not necessarily institutionalized or had parents who were very involved in their treatment. The culmination of that project was his groundbreaking study, which was shocking to many people because the title of the study actually has normal functioning in the title. It incorporates those words. And when this came out and was published in 87, it caused quite a stir because that was not the sense, that was not the thinking that there would be any prospect for normal functioning if an individual uh, was diagnosed with autism. Well, we now know that ABA applied comprehensively, intensively, right uh, supervision and so forth and so on uh, can make a significant difference in the lives of many children. It's probably the most well-researched part of our uh, applied field right now. Since him, his, uh, since Lovas's publication, there have been a number of replications by independent researchers. Um, we've been involved in some of that. There also have been some very powerful meta-analyses that have been done in which multiple studies are examined in terms of their ability to uh, move certain dependent measures. And there's also now some follow-up studies which show that the gains that you see in early intervention are being maintained. And in fact, the, the whole goal of being able to move trajectories ha is possible. But I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about how things are, what we know about what those actual outcomes are, and some of the challenges that we have. In almost every of the studies, every the study, every one of the studies that are listed up here, there was some kind of comparison group. Um, maybe it was treatment as usual. Maybe it was community services, and so forth and so on. In many of them, the comparison group was composed of children who were receiving eclectic treatment, meaning that they were receiving a lot of services, perhaps by speech pathologists, occupational therapies, special education teachers. Many of them also, in, when they're receiving eclectic intervention, also will receive some level of ABA. Eclectic intervention is arguably the most widespread and frequently chosen intervention for children with autism in the United States and outside of the United States. I'm going to show you some individual outcome data for uh, individuals, meaning it's individual children, uh, who participated in two of our studies. And first we're going to take a look at the children who received eclectic treatment. Again, this is a mixture of methods, and then we're going to take a look at the children who received ABA treatment three years after, for, for a period of three years. Now, I want to explain a little bit about what we're looking at here. Along the horizontal axis are cognitive scores, and so the farther to the right you go, the better your cognitive score is. And the, on this particular axis is composite adaptive or self-help scores. The higher you go on the y-axis, the better things are. And these two outcome measures, cognitive functioning and adaptive functioning, 
are two of the best predictors of where children who are starting school are going to end up in terms of their adult lives, ability to, to finish high school, be in general education, so forth and so on. So on the left, in that lower right-hand corner right here, you see the baseline scores for the children who are in the eclectic group. So what you can see is that no one is in that upper right-hand quadrant, which is where you'd like people to be. Almost everybody's down here, meaning they're below normal in cognitive scores, adaptive functioning, so forth and so on. Let's see what happens after three years of treatment. Now you see the dots move. Those are the children's performances. So actually the children. The gray spots show where they were at baseline. The black ones are where they were when they ended up. So one of the things that you can see is that for many of the children in the eclectic group, they didn't move much. They were below normal in their cognitive scores. They were below normal in their adaptive scores at the beginning and after three years of treatment. Now there are some move children who moved up here and at least one who moved into the normal range on both. But in general, the, we would not, we're not seeing what we'd like to see there. And let's see what happens for children who are in the eclectic group, uh, I'm sorry, in the ABA group. Oh. oh, we're gonna do it again, I'm sorry. Now let's watch what happens to children in the ABA group. So again, remembering our goal would be to have everybody up here uh, and remember that the gray spaces represent where they were at baseline. So one of the things that you can see is that there are many more children ended up in the normal range on those two measures. You saw more of a movement towards that upper right quadrant. What you can also see is that ABA does not uh, affect everybody in the same way. So we've still got some work to do in terms of figuring out what our treatment protocol should look like and who it is that really benefits from intensive comprehensive treatment. I'm also going to show you one more slide and this is from the same study and what it's looking at is what's the probability of normal functioning if you received ABA versus uh, uh, eclectic intervention. And for cognitive scores, you're twice as more likely to score in the normal range if you've received ABA. Your language scores, receptive and expressive, are much more likely to be in the name, a normal range, as are your adaptive scores. Now, having said that, I, what I want to say is it's not, the, it's not the treatment that most parents pick. And so even when we are sharing with them the data, we have, to try, we have to do a better job of trying to understand how it is that parents decide treatment, what it is that uh, guides their decision, because clearly the data are suggesting that the treatment that they are most likely to choose is not going to put their child in the kind of position that's going to make it more likely that he or she is going to go on and be able to be in general education or finish high school or so forth and so on. So we've got some work to do on that end of things and I think we are seeing more discussions in the field about how patients make decisions and working with families um, so that we make sure that they are getting the information that they need. To sort of sum up where we are in terms of comprehensive intensive early intervention, I would say the take home is that the goal is to prevent intellectual disabilities. One of the things that we saw uh, is that they're twice as likely to score in the normal range at the time that they're entering a school if they receive intensive comprehensive intervention than if they do not and it spills over to all those other domains. We also know that the type of intervention, meaning ABA, and, in, and the intensity of intervention tend to predict the outcome. So if you want to follow up with some of those meta-analyses, um, that would be a good place to look. We have some suggestions that the amount and quality of supervision uh, can positively impact patient outcome, but it's an area that needs more study as 
does the specific components of treatment. There's a lot of variation in what is identified as comprehensive early intervention based on ABA. We also have to start looking at its efficacy with older children and other populations. Most of what we know about comprehensive intensive early intervention is based on autism. So we, we do need the opportunity to look more closely at older children and other populations. Okay. Now we're going to switch and talk about focused intervention. <laughs> and focused intervention is, within the ABA world, I would say, probably what most individuals, adults, teenagers, and children are receiving. And here's what I mean by focused intervention. We're talking about focusing on just a few target behaviors, and largely this is because the resources, the hours of intervention, something is prohibiting uh, uh, or, may, or may, there may not be the need to have a comprehensive program. So there, you're focusing on just a couple of target behaviors. There are tend to be less intensity in duration. In comprehensive early intervention, we might be talking about 30 to 40 hours over a period of two or three years. For focused interventions, you might be talking about 10, 15 hours a week, maybe uh, being renewed at six months at a time, maybe lasting as long as a year or a year and a half. But it is the most common form of ABA. Now, one of the reasons why it probably is the most common form of ABA is it's really ac appropriate across the lifespan so that you may be seeing focused <coughs> intervention being given to young children related to eating, uh, leisure skills, educational skills, working in the community, um, self-help, transportation, so forth and so on. So it has wide applicability. Uh, but, at, but again, the defining features of it are few target behaviors at a time, it's less intense in its uh, duration, and, but it has some, we have a big issue that we need to be able to try and address within focused intervention, and it looks something like this. If you're a clinician and you have an individual referred to you for ABA services, you can look across all these domains where there may be some help that's needed. Maybe language, it could be um, self-management, it could be there's uh, some behavior problems, it might be going out into, related to going out into the community, so forth and so on. The full array of domains or areas for focus could be presented to you. But because you've got a limited amount of time, resources to allocate, you have to make decisions about where you're, where you're going to start. So it's almost as if you've got all these possibilities, but really what's coming down to it is that you're going to have to pick three or four or five or whatever it happens to be. And we don't really have great uh, clinical guidelines right now for telling uh, clinicians, ha having some guidance for practitioners. These are the ones you should tackle first. Um, it, these are sort of keystone or pivotal behaviors that you need to focus on first. And of course, if it turns out that there's a behavior issue that's wildly disruptive or challenging, you're going to have to concentrate on that before you're going to be able to do anything else. I think what happens is right now clinicians take their best guess. They rely on experience, they may consult with others. Obviously they're talking to the family, sometimes they're talking to the client. Um, but I think one of the things that we're going to need to do as a profession is develop some better guidelines for folks in terms of helping them make decisions uh, about the w areas of focus for their intervention since it is so limited. Um, and the last area I'm going to talk about is the treatment of severe problem behavior. So this is our third and last category. Now, one of the things you're seeing all those titles disappear, education, place of living, community, job, that's what happens with severe problem behavior. Uh, it diminishes the quality of someone's life to such a way that the restriction on their family, where they can live, where they can go to school, whether or not if they're an adult they can be in a day program, uh, uh, it, it, it creates a kind of snowball uh, that 
really leads to some disastrous consequences. And with the increase, particularly in number of individuals with autism that are going into their, that are teens, early 20s, we are seeing an enormous increase in the number of individuals who are being brought to uh, emergency rooms, who are being brought to the police station and so forth and so on uh, because their families or their care homes or, or whatever are simply not able to handle them anymore. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what, what the ramifications are for some of that. Typically, when you're talking about severe behavior problem, it's because somebody's doing too much of something. It's not that they're not necessarily doing, uh, refusing to do things, although that may happen too. Most often we're talking about danger, aggression, physical property destruction, inappropriate sexual behavior, uh, so forth and so on. Things that will, will uh, endanger other people, they make people not want to have them around, they limit their, their interactions. Uh, and I'm going to take you a little bit through the history of the work that's been done here because, again, this is another area where behavior analysis has really uh, done its homework and laid down a very good foundation. Some people would argue that the roots of uh, dealing with severe behavior problem actually started out with Ted Ione and, and Jack Michael in the article that was published. Uh, the, the psychiatric nurse as a behavioral engineer. The patients that Ted Aon treated during his uh, time in that hospital were not necessarily so physically destructive or challenging, but what he did was he really focused on a particular uh, intervention that would address the function of the diverse problem behaviors that he was being confronted with, whether it was annoying staff or hoarding towels or so forth or so on. So he really tried to look at what's the probable function of that uh, behavior and designed an intervention around that. But it was probably really the work that was done by Ed Carr and then later by Mark Duran in the 70s in which they really started to focus on self-injurious behavior and trying to use communication as a replacement for that self-injurious behavior. That work was being started by Ed and then continued on, but it was really the work that Brian Iwata did at Kennedy Krieger that gave us a specific standardized methodology that would allow us to understand the function of, of severe behavior. And uh, I think many people are already familiar with the common functions of challenging behaviors, uh, that you receive something tangible, that you receive social attention when you engage in the problem behavior, that you have a chance to escape or avoid an unwanted demand or situation, or that there seems to be some inherent uh, sensory qualities that provide that reinforcement. So we really have Brian to thank for the work that he did to s formalize and standardize that that methodology. The treatment of, of severe behavior, once you understand the function, usually then now we're going to work on an intervention that addresses that function by replacing it with a behavior that seems to match that particular function. Oftentimes that involves uh, embedding a communication system that might not have been there before or teaching someone to tolerate delay to reinforcement, handling denials, and establishing leisure skills because one of the sad things is for a lot of individuals who are limited in their communication abilities or their cognitive abilities, they don't have a lot of skills in which they can uh, uh, occupy themselves or recruit reinforcement from others and they will engage then in problem behavior. We're going to take a look at one study that was done that I think does a nice demonstration of how this methodology works. Uh, this happened to be an eight-year-old who was in a wheelchair and had tra traumatic brain injury and, and was also diagnosed with uh, epilepsy. The sad 
thing here is that this child was removed from his home and removed from his sisters because he was engaging in such high rates of inappropriate sexual behavior. So he, even though he was wheel-bound, wheelchair-bound, so he couldn't get out of his wheelchair, what he would do is he would grope and reach and pinch uh, their buttocks, their breasts, and so forth and so on. So he had to be removed from his home because of that, and that's an example of what happens to individuals who have severe challenging behaviors. Their world starts being disruptive, their lives become smaller, they lose opportunities. So in this particular case, they wanted to look at what were the circumstances under which the inappropriate sexual behavior would occur and so in this particular case what they did was they devised 20 minute sessions in which under this condition play he free access to toys and I think uh, verbal attention or reinforcement was pro provided every 30 seconds something like that and so you can see that there were no occurrences of inappropriate sexual behavior under those circumstances. By the way, in, the, in this case, what would happen is the uh, staff would block attempts to grab or whatever while they were doing this. Um, and then under this condition, demand, they would postpone a request or uh, for 30 seconds if he engaged in inappropriate sexual, uh, sexual behavior. If they asked him to do something and he did it, he would get attention. So you can see under both the play and the demand conditions, it's not happening. But here's what happened when they provided attention contingent on uh, engaging in inappropriate sexual behavior. They would give a sort of mild reprimand, don't do that or stop that. And so they were able to determine that the inappropriate sexual behavior was being maintained by attention. So knowing that, you, they designed an intervention, uh, and we'll see that down here below, in which here's, here's their baseline conditions in which they are providing attention, reprimand, if you will, uh, if inappropriate sexual behavior occurs. Here's where they replace it with primarily functional communication training. They gave him a card and he could exchange that card for 30 seconds of attention and one of the things that you see is that the behavior doesn't happen. The requests to communicate are happening at a high frequency. They do a reversal to verify the function and so forth and so on. So uh, this is a nice clean demonstration, probably doesn't always go quite this cleanly, of uh, how you do a functional analysis to determine the function of a severe behavior and then design an intervention um, so that you can re replace that. Um, there are some challenges in serving individuals with this particular, these kinds of problems. One thing is oftentimes you need specialized training and resources. You might need a purpose-built environment with padded walls. Your staff needs special training and as you can see in this photo, uh, specialized equipment that's to keep the staff safe, to keep the client safe. And, and I would tell you that there are in my experience, not as many people who are interested in working with this kind of population. Um, so it's sometimes difficult to recruit staff to do it. And another problem that we, I would say that we've had a lot of experience with in the work we do in California is that by the time the individual is referred for treatment, there are very few, he's out of his home with his family his, uh, his family is perhaps not willing to take him back. The care homes that are willing to take individuals uh, with these kinds of challenging behaviors are very few in number. There may be no day treatment programs that are willing to take them, even when you tell them, you know, we'll be sending staff. But those opportunities are everything in terms of generalizing behavior change and so forth and so on. Anyway, that is a problem, and of course it's a result, in my mind, of the fact that there's 
a negative reinforcement paradigm operating here, meaning that people are not concerned or willing to pay for services until things are really bad. And so the family's house has been totally destroyed, or now he's been taken to the um, emergency room a couple of times, or the police have been called. And that's really not uh, going to set us up for success in the future. So that's probably a funding public policy kind of issue, uh, th the latter. But I think we also need to do a better job of recruiting behavior analysts to be interested in working with this particular population. And this population is growing. Since um, Brian's work at Kennedy Krieger, others have continued um, alongside him to refine the methodology, uh, test out variations of different approaches, finding ways in which we can look at pre precursors a bit early, uh, finding ways in which we can uh, make the uh, assessment perhaps more cost effective, uh, more generalizable. Uh, I've got Wayne Fisher, Lou Agopi, and Greg Hanley up there. There are others th that are certainly working on this, and it's going to be an area that we continue to need to do more work in. I would like to close today by just sort of reminding everybody that this work is, is fantastic. It has evolved over really 50 years or more. And we should be proud of the fact that it's focused on improving the quality of life, not only for the individual, but for their families. I, I think it's absolutely paramount that we communicate to people that what we do is promote independence, that we are working so that people have options, that they have opportunities to live their lives in as full a way as possible. That's really what we do when we do applied behavior analysis. But we've got some things on our to-do list, and one of those things is to work to broaden access to treatment because of the autism reform movement, insurance reform movement. Individuals with autism now have broader access to services, which is fabulous. We need to look at other populations. Some of the ones that I listed in the opening slide uh, don't necessarily have access to ABA services. We also don't know what would happen for individuals who are born with Down syndrome. What would their lives be like if they had uh, early intensive intervention? We don't know. That's not really been funded. We also have work to do with regards to developing our clinical standards. I made some reference to some of the work that needs to be done to help individuals who are providing focused intervention be more selective in their targets, but we also have to come to some consensus about what constitutes the foundation of high quality or comprehensive early in intervention programs. And we really need to be focusing on good outcome measures so that we can figure out how it is that we are, what it is that we're doing well, what it is that we could do better, and we need to be able to communicate to that to those who fund us. Autism is a very expensive condition. Uh, ABA is also a rather expensive treatment compared to uh, being prescribed a pill to take or something of that sort. So we need to be working with all the stakeholders to look to ways in which our services can continue to improve the quality of life of others, but with an eye on making it more cost effective and efficient. So thank you very much. Am I done?